Today's episode of Nerd Soup is brought to you by Skillshare. To start the new year, Skillshare is giving away a free two-month unlimited access trial to the first 500 people who click the link in the description box below. After that, it's only around $10 a month to maintain your subscription. Start off the new year by taking the first steps in learning a new skill and becoming a new you. Skillshare is a product that we are excited to share with our subscribers because when we scroll through the comments of our videos, we see how clever you guys are with the quips, you're informative, you guys know what you're talking about. Skillshare is a site that will help you channel your cleverness and fuel your creativity by providing you with over 25,000 classes in a multitude of categories like design, business, and more. It depends on what you want to do. Maybe you want to take those first steps into becoming a YouTuber, becoming a video editor, a photographer, a filmmaker. But you just don't know where to start. You don't know where to go to learn these necessary softwares and tools that will help you kickstart your projects. Well, that's what Skillshare is for. It's like an online Hogwarts. It takes the weight off of your mind, knowing that there's a place where you can sit through these courses and classes, and they will give you step-by-step -step tutorials on how these softwares work. By taking one of these courses, in just a couple of hours, you can go from novice to creator. If you have ideas, Skillshare will help you bring them to life. We at NerdSoup are always trying to improve our skills, so taking courses for softwares like Final Cut Pro, Harmony Pro, After Effects, Photoshop, the softwares that we use, taking these courses are essential in improving our work. And like I said, it, it's just a weight off of your mind, knowing that you can plug in a class, you can look through the thousands of different courses that they have and know you're going to take something away from it, that you're going to improve yourself and your work by the end of the day. And remember that Skillshare is giving away a free two-month unlimited access trial to the first 500 people who click the link in the description box below. So you can join the up to 7 million creators who are fueling their curiosity, expanding their creativity, and even improving their skills needed in their careers by using Skillshare. Game of Thrones Season 5, Episode 1, The Wars to Come, and The Revisiteds to Come. Ten more. <laughs> The home stretch. Thank God. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> Hope everyone had a Merry Christmas. Trailer didn't Have come out. Yourself. Well, you can't blame us. That's no. HBO. Well, I tweeted. You definitely could not blame us. My sources I are saying. I couldn't stress it enough. Super Bowl. It's so funny, too, because you could tell the people who are co interacting with us on Twitter and on uh, YouTube, the ones that listened to the podcast where we said it was basically we, we were just going to push the narrative and hopefully HBO would be pressured into doing it. And the people that thought that we actually had insiders at HBO, which which was fun for a while, pretending like, yeah, we got some people that planted in the HBO headquarters. No, we just made it up. No plants. <laughs> no ambiguous ending like Inception. The dreidel just fell over. This is real life. It's not fantasy. That's but at that, least we have Game of Thrones. That didn't work out for me. Getting Trying to get T-Pain from the Game of Thrones didn't work out. Ah, no, that's still up in the air. Well, I tried Obama today because he released his top 10 favorite movies of the year. Like, hey, come on the pod to discuss. Barry O on the soup. Haven't heard back. I'd rather get Biden. I'm not sure if he's a big film guy. I think he's a better podcast guy, though. He's like Obama's Teddy. Well, both of you come on and see who the better podcaster is. Only way to uh, find out. Let them fight. Yeah. <laughs> So I was a little confused at the beginning of this episode because I could have swore this season began with a cold opening. I thought Maggie the Frog was a cold opening. I, um... I think you said that on a previous video, right? No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. But I double-checked because, you know, like on HBO Go where you have the... They have, like, the preview, the previous episode, and yes. uh, an ad for another HBO series. So I usually skip all that along with the theme. That's HBO's ads. It's just all HBO stuff. Yeah, but I went back and double checked just to make sure. But no, just Maggie the Frog. Yeah, Maggie the Frog. But it is a great opening to the season. It's a cold opening for the season because it really sets where Cersei's arc is going in this uh, season five, where she becomes so obsessed with maintaining her power and the lengths that she's willing to go. But to see her as a child, she hasn't changed much. <laughs> no, wasn't much to grow into for Cersei. <laughs> no, this like, was always an asshole. <laughs> like you said, D and D is always uh, stayed away from flashbacks. I think they even said that they won't do flashbacks. Is this the first one? Yeah, the first one. Oh, and then, wow. And then obviously we see with Bran. We get flashbacks through his point of view. Right. So, yeah, it was interesting to see. I mean, it, it just builds, like you said, it it's basically dictates where Cersei's character is going for the remainder of the season and a lot of season six. It was always something a lot of book readers looked back upon to try to prophesy where Cersei's going to end up and what's where she's going to end. And it was kind of, it was nice to see on screen. 
Yeah, and it shows that even Cersei in her youth was so concerned about where her life was going, where she was going to end up, was she going to be married to Rhaegar. They don't use his name, which is weird. Uh, would have been a nice nod to Rhaegar and the fact that he was betrothed to Cersei, because it just adds to the history of the relationship between Tywin and the Mad King about how they had that falling out and why Cersei was not allowed to marry Rhaegar anymore. Just another thread into the ball of yarn that was the Targaryen problems. Um, but yeah, Cersei going to see Maggie the Frog, and Mar Maggie the Frog is a frightening character at first, because you're not sure what they're doing in this weird grass hut thing in the middle of nowhere. What does she do all day? Sleep. Yeah? Yeah, sleep and drink people's blood. It's like a vampire. Yeah, she kind of is. Put up like a sign, like, I'll read your fortune for a gold dragon. Or Monetize yeah. that shit, Maggie. What are you doing? Uh, well, she, you know, she gets copyrighted. H by the, HBO? By the ghost of uh, High Heart. Oh, okay. Gotcha. She did it first. But yeah, there's some interesting omissions from the prophecy that she gives Cersei that are in the books that aren't in the show. Here, she tells her that um, she will never marry the prince, but marry a king, that a younger a younger queen will come and take her place, and that she'll have many children, but uh, your husband will have three. And they'll well, have she'll have three. Her husband will have 20. 20, yeah. I, didn't, so that's I forgot Robert. the number, so I use many. 20 is many, so. No, yeah, yeah. And a couple is five. Um, <laughs> and, and gold will be their crowns. So. And gold will be their shrouds. Yeah, whatever. So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, the first one, she'll never marry Prince Rhaegar, which comes true. The second one, she'll marry the king, King Robert, and he'll have all his bastards, and she'll have the three kids with Jamie, Tommen, Joffrey, Marcella, and they will all die. So a lot of people think that in season eight, Cersei will not have her child with Jamie, that she's only destined to have three kids. And the young queen one is interesting because there was a time where you could think that it was Marjorie. Mm-hmm. But most people think it's Daenerys. And so far, Maggie the Frog's been pretty much on the money. So you think Cersei's kind of looking down the barrel in season eight, or down the dragon. Well, there's no Valonqar here, so... No Valonqar. That Which I think they left out so that anybody could kill Cersei. Do you think it was a conscious decision to... By D&D. &D? Yeah. Kind like, of leave uh, it open-ended for them to change what's going to happen to her? Yeah, or yeah. So that, like, Arya could kill her. Yeah, that could probably, I could see that happening. Or it could have been something where we've already seen these prophecies kind of take place for the most part. So it's kind of would be a spoiler. But the same thing, because yeah, in the books. Yeah, in the books, she's on the money too. Well, Marcella's still alive. Tom is still alive. They're, that is true, right? Yeah, so right. by the time we got to this, and there's so many different, what is it, fucking five years now since season five? give or take so there have been plenty of time for this to manifest and to map it out and see all these came true and this is the last one so that's kind of will be a spoiler but you can argue because jamie's like a little bit younger than her and T Tyrion, so you can play with that but george always says you should never take prophecy literally so people have played with the valencar prophecy in the books as well that they say euron's a younger brother so he'll kill cersei or podrick had an older brother so he might be the valencar but a lot of people think poetically it would make more sense if it was jamie What's uh, Hot Pie's family looking like? Hot Pie? Does Hot Pie? Does he have an older brother? Uh, <laughs> just, just Pie? Just Pie. Yeah, yeah, he was Hot Pie. Yeah. Or he could be Hot Pie Jr. if his dad was... Uh, listen, the Valonqar, leaving it out. I don't like it, but that's all I'll say. But I understand why they did it. But I wouldn't have done that. The way that it changes, too, where we see Cersei as an adult walking up to the Sept of Baelor to see Tywin Lannister for the last time, and that quick glance that she share shares with Marjorie. Marjorie's like, damn, I just can't crack this cookie. She'll never like me. Yeah. For who I am. She's tried. If only it was that innocent. <laughs> yeah, she has tried. <laughs> well, she did threaten to have her strangled, so that could you could see why that might cause a divide in their relationship. She kids. Yeah, jo you know, pals, you know? That's how we joke around here in, West in the King's Landing. Yeah, and I wonder if this whole facade, if it is a facade that she's so depressed about Tywin, if, if it's just not an attempt to manipulate Jaime. Because in the previous episode, season four finale, she says, fuck Tywin Lannister, I never loved him, he never loved us. But now she's so just distraught over Tywin's death. I think she's trying to nail home to Jaime that Tyrion was the enemy, and you have to become the new Tywin, because that's better for our position. Yeah, well, she tries to... Obviously, Tyrion is to blame, because he did carry out the act, but she's trying to explain to Jamie the implications that this has on their family. And Jamie does too in a way where he's saying they need to watch out for everyone else trying to take away everything Tywin built for them. But Cersei's trying to put that, yeah, that's what Tyrion did. Not them out there, it was Tyrion. Yeah, and it does work because Jamie does come to hate Tyrion for what he did for a time. And we see their reunion in season seven, which is a scene that I actually liked. But we get more into that perspective in the books and Jamie's chapters when he's thinking to himself, this makes him want to take up the mantle of the line of Lannister.
to be that man that his father always wanted him to be. It's ironic because Tywin had to be killed by Tyrion in order for Jaime to accept his role. Cersei's even pointing some of the blame to Jaime, too, because yeah, he's, he's let one him free. Yeah. yeah, and she walks out in that final shot of Jaime overlooking Tywin and just a final goodbye. Charles Dance, I guess, technically he's in season five, so yeah. it's the last time we see him. Those eyes always freak me out. Yeah, what the hell? Imagine if they blinked. Uh, uh. <laughs> And then Tyrion in Pentos, and the way that this shot is, the way that this is shot with him in the crate, going through the streets, getting off the boat, you can just feel how nauseous this character is when he gets out of the crate, and Varys has to kind of use the, the crowbar to get him out. Tyrion just stumbles out, and he's a mess. Did the crate have to be that small? Yeah, it could have got him a bigger crate. I yeah. Mean, I don't come know. on, man. But Great back and forth, too, when he's talking about, you know how it feels to push your shit out of a little hole? It's like, no, but I know how it is to throw your shit overboard. That kind of explains their relationship. That Tyrion shits and Varys has been cleaning it up. It's like a fecal alley oop. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's Paul to Griffin. I was kind of upset when I first saw this that there was no Illyrio. That's weird too, yeah. Like we're in Illyrio's house. He's on vacation. It would have been cool to see him one more time. Yeah. And they have a great back and forth in the books, I believe. And oh, book, yeah, book, yeah. Uh, Dance with, with Dragons. Was it five? Oh yeah, because they did the split. But yeah, Varys tells him about he and Illy- Varys tells him about he and Illyrio's plan for the Targaryen restoration, and it's kind of the first time. I mean, there are hints throughout the previous seasons, mainly the um, when Arya sees them in the uh, dungeons of King's Landing with the with the dragon skulls. But it's like the first real time you actually hear him say it, and you kind of get an idea of. Varys' grand plan. Right, and this is where they stake their claim that Aegon, young Griff, does not exist in the show, that Varys is a Targaryen loyalist, that he has been for many years, and the original plan was to have Viserys sit on the throne, which is just, it's just so much more interesting in the book, and I guess now is as good a time as any. They should have included young Griff. Yeah, especially what we've seen with the Sand Snakes this season, where at the time... But they could have done the Sand Snakes better, too. You could have had both and maybe split the season in two. Well, the Sand Snakes technically shouldn't even have been the focus. It should have been Ariane. Yeah, true. Which, it just, it's it's so weird, season five. We've talked about Varys' plans numerous occasions. Um, it kind of, here he's just saying that he wants what's good for the realm, which you can argue back and forth that there are many other things you could have done than basically, there's so many different things at play where to put all your be- uh, eggs in a Viserys basket was not the best for the realm, A. No, it makes no sense. And it's not a sure thing, too. At least with Young Griff, you can theorize, and, you know, there's all these different theories about the Blackfire and how Varys is related to him somehow, or Illyrio is, and it gives him a more, it gives him a bigger connection to the actual Game of Thrones going on. He's a pet project. Yeah. Young Griff. They literally raised him to be the perfect king. Guy speaks like 18 languages. He's very smart. He's good looking. He's bright. He's a good leader. This is somebody that you do put all your eggs in that basket because you know you've had a hand in in his upbringing. Dragon eggs, if you will. Okay, well, yeah, well, Blackfire eggs. Okay. I don't know if those hatch. But Varys, I mean, I guess we'll skip ahead to when Tyrion kind of cleans himself up a bit, and he is wallowing in his own self-pity here. Great line when he says, Varys tells Tyrion there are quicker ways to kill yourself, and Tyrion snaps back real quick. There are faster ways to kill yourself. Not for a coward. You are many things, my friend, but not a coward. He's given up on life, that he's possibly even suicidal. That he is drinking to die, but he's almost too much of a coward to take his own life in that messy way. And we see that with people, where they just give up on themselves, on the world, and he says the past was shit, the future is shit. And Varys here, even when he's talking about this new leader that we that we need in Westeros, it could have been young Griff, mm-hmm. but it's Daenerys. It's intriguing, too, for Tyrion. I mean, he says, you can either stay here or you can come with me to meet Daenerys. And he's like, yeah, can I drink on the way or something like that? Yeah. But I think it does intrigue him a little where it is interesting to meet this long-lost Targaryen princess who's said to have three dragons and a massive army and she's conquering cities. And Tyrion's at his best and probably his happiest when he's in the mix. So he, may, he sees this as maybe a new lease on life where his old life is gone, but he has another chance to take that back. Yeah, and Varys describing his greatest traits when he says, you have the political wit of Tywin, yet you have compassion. You have your father's instincts for politics, and you have compassion. Compassion, yes. I killed my lover with my bare hands. I shot my own father with a crossbow. I never said you were perfect. 
But Tyrion is somebody that you want in the fray, especially if you're trying to build a better world. And I don't, I don't hate what the change that they made to Varys, where he is a character that's looking out for the powerless. I think it is interesting. I remember you made the point years ago that maybe Varys and Littlefinger are just two sides of the same coin, where he's looking out for people and Littlefinger's looking out for numero uno. The book version of Varys is far more interesting, but this isn't terrible by any means. It's not like the Sand Snakes, where the change is so egregious. No, it's not an egregious change at all, but like you said, it's more interesting in the books. Right, and maybe, you know, it depends on what you really want to focus on. You can only, I mean, there's another thing I'm going to complain at the end of this episode about Mance Raider and his character development. We really... <laughs> season 5 is... Buckle wasted up. no time getting into Season 5 and <laughs> <laughs> buckle much up, we dislike kid. it. <laughs> it's not that I dislike it because I do, I still enjoy Varys and people say, oh, well, you just became too much of a side character. It's like, he's always been a side character. He's never had that much focus, except in season two. So, yeah, they're going out to see Daenerys, and I enjoy Tyrion's arc for the most part. I don't think Tyrion suffers in this season um, like other people do. I think Tyrion's fine. Yeah. A little bit more interesting in the book, but... <laughs> yeah. Count out how many times we say in the books in season five, and... Well, I said last episode, too, that I don't hate season five by any stretch, but there is a better version out there, and... <laughs> yeah. It's not the. It doesn't live up to the previous seasons. Yeah, it's just not not as close in quality as the previous seasons. Going to Marine, and we see the rebellion in Marine that the Unsullied are still taking down the statues of the last harpy, and Daenerys is establishing control. And this was a scene that was always so interesting in a weird way because Missande makes the point too. Why would an Unsullied go to a brothel? And we see that this is a guy. This is a man who is just looking for a motherly figure, somebody to take care of him, something that he's probably never had to be in a woman's arms not in a sexual way but it's sad especially when he gets his throat slit <laughs> yeah i was gonna say it didn't really work out for him but <laughs> <laughs> no it's brutal brutal cutthroat too that was uh oh yeah right there for you and they focus on the neck man the way the camera's panning yeah yeah it's disgusting right in the adam's apple but even before that though it is a kind of it's you know it's sad but it's nice to see like it's I don't know, it's just a moment that helps, I guess. Humanizes the Unsullied. Yeah, and introduces them in a more sympathetic light to the audience. We only really had Grey Worm, mm -hmm. and so it's nice to see, you know, use this character as a generalization for the rest of the army. This guy looks like Grey Worm on steroids. Yeah, he's like, cut yeah, up. Yeah. Well, yeah. He's coming up a little bit. Yeah, his, well. His neck is a little cut up, too. Yeah, literally. That shot, too, when he's looking up at the last harpy, uh, one of the sons of the harpy, and the prostitute. You're thinking, oh, these guys are formidable. Maybe not as fighters, but as thinkers. Like, they can't out-fight, you know, Westerosi knights and Antelli. Ah. Yeah, going to Danny's war council, she's very upset about the news, and she wants justice for this unsullied soldier, and just speaks to her character, too, that she's just so enraged over the death of one of her soldiers. Look at somebody like a Tywin Lannister. Soldiers are expendable, but not to Daenerys. She takes it personally. If she's trying to build a new world, then this has to stop. And we also see Masador, who was the slave from last season that was kind of leading the charge for them to rebel. And he's kind of like an envoy between Daenerys and the former slaves, where he can feel out the emotions and and he knows the city that's what dario tells her you need to know the people you need to know the the city like you were saying with danny's uh enragement over the death of one of her unsullied she even calls for a proper burial and something that she knows that will anger the sons of the harpy even more great line too when she says that angry snakes lash out makes chopping off their heads that much easier find the men who did this and bring them to me Okay. And it kind of just shows Daenerys' character where if she doesn't care, it's she's taking it so personally. It might not have been the right decision, as we see what happens with the rise of the Sons of the Harp Harpy, but in this moment, she's very set on wanting to, like you said, enrage the snake. She has good intentions, but not good decision-making. And we see that over and over again with her, but she's learning. And she's put into a tough situation. I mean, to learn to be a ruler, we talked about young Griff, that he's been trained his whole life. It's like, yeah, she's got raw talent, but she needs some time here. It makes sense why she keeps making these poor decisions. And we mentioned how Masande confronts Grey Worm. And it is interesting. I think Masande's trying to feel out here, like, are they capable of love? Or do they still have their penises, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Maybe there's a chance. Back north, and this is a great callback line when John is training Ollie, when we all still loved Ollie, and John acting as the father figure to this orphan kid. I liked him. You loved him? Well, we all still liked. We were, we were rooting for Ollie. Lukewarm. Lukewarm. Indifferent. Yeah. I liked him. But the line, too, where Ned was, when he was training Benjen, 
back in season six when Bran and the Three Out Raven go back to Winterfell years ago in one of the flashbacks, and they have the same line, keep your shield up or I'll ring your head like a bell. And it's cool that John, that's the line that he uses because it's probably the same thing that Ned said to him when he was younger. And you have Sam and Gilly chatting as Alistair Thorne walks by, and they talk about how there's going to be a new selection for the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, and Gilly's a little nervous here because she doesn't know what's going to happen to her. Uh, she obviously knows that Alistair is not the biggest fan of wildlings, so you got to worry about yourself every now and then. No, yeah, I mean, it makes sense why she's nervous, and the fact that she's been there for that long is incredible. That Sam's kind of just got his lover sitting there with him. <laughs> Sam does have a lot of people that are looking out for him with Maester Aemon, the, rela- the relationships that he's forged, so I guess he feels comfortable with keeping Gilly there. Would have been interesting to see Sam try and run away if Alistair Thorne did become Lord Commander. Shouldn't you be training too? Well, I'm hardly a new recruit. How many brothers can say that they've killed a White Walker and a Then? I might be the first in history. Yeah, Alistair Thorne is a character that after you see him in, during Watchers on the Wall, you respect him more. Mm-hmm. And in this scene, he's kind of tolerable. Doesn't say anything to John while John is training the soldiers. But Melisandre comes up behind him, and she brings him to Stannis. The scenes between John and Stannis are all great in yeah. season five. People like to criticize show Stannis, but I feel like there's a lot of great moments, and he kind of steals a lot of scenes just by his nature, because he doesn't have a way with words. It's Stannis Baratheon, and just how he's trying to get Jon to do this for him, he's just bringing up things that he thinks that will like enrage Jon and give him motive. Talking about Ruse Bolton sitting at the seat of Winterfell after stabbing your brother, <laughs> like things like that, where... He's not, he doesn't try to be coy or beat around the bush. He's going to go straight at it. He's a straight shooter. Yeah, he's playing towards his emotions, yeah. which is smart, but John proves to be very mentally formidable, mm-hmm. where he's not going to easily crack, and neither is Mance Raider, and that's what he tasks him with getting Mance Raider to fight for him. For people that criticize show Stannis, they're the same exact character. <laughs> There's no difference. <laughs> Stannis in the book is just as boring, but him being so boring is what makes him likable, almost. Yeah. Well, because he's so dull that you root for him, because in this world of all these colorful characters, he's somebody that's brutally honest. Voice served thieves according to their deserts, as you well know, Sir Davos. Joffrey, Renly, Rob Stark, they're all thieves. They'll bend the knee or I'll destroy them. Interesting to see that dynamic with other supporting characters. We've seen it enough with Davos, but Melisandre, then you get John and... I don't know, it's just fun to watch him interact with other people. Yeah, yeah, he's a good character to have these other personalities bounce off of because he is so basic. Um, Their ending's obviously different. We don't know how he's going to end in the book, but they're the same fucking character. I mean, come on. Yeah, like you said, he wants Jon to convince Mance to have the Wildlings join his army in exchange for land in the north. And Can't even give him a week. He's like, how long do I have? <laughs> yeah. Five minutes, starting I, now. Well, no, he's like... Uh, Four minutes, 59 seconds. He's like this evening, and, you know, daytime runs, <laughs> runs short this time of year. It's ridiculous, man. <laughs> I think he probably, he's probably confident that they're going to fight with me anyway. They have no choice. Well, we'll get to it when we talk about John's meeting with Mance. John makes a lot of good points. Sometimes pride isn't always the best route. Well, Stan is here tell the deal that they're willing to give it's them. It's a good deal. Why didn't he mention that deal to Mance? guess for writing reasons because Mance had to die Mm -hmm. that's the choice they made if you told Mance hey we're gonna make you citizens of the realm of course you have to fight for us what do you think what what do you think we've been doing south of the wall for the past five years we're always fighting you have to fight you were fighting us yeah you just got into a big fight you were ready to you were sending giants at our fucking wall I would have like uh antagonized them a little like oh the wildlings say you're such great fighters can't handle it in westeros huh no no it's fine you don't have to fight it's like yeah you were good in triple a but come on this is the majors right here let's see what you got yeah entice them a little bit something else for us to complain about littlefinger and sansa (laughs) i bet people were so confused when they saw this scene for the first time where the hell are they going i don't know i mean it's (laughs) it's set up they're watching robin train robin not looking too hot but um, <laughs> no, he's not. they're going to leave him with Lord Royce. And I think they try to, they have the conversation about like Littlefinger scared that Sansa's secret will leak and things like that. And it's like, oh, do you trust your men? It's like, oh no, but I pay him. Cool. Um, it's obviously just Littlefinger's plan, right? He wants to marry Sansa to uh, Ramsay. We don't know that at this point, but it happens. It does. Yeah. And assume that many people were confused because, I mean, we'll get into it more as the season progresses but it's just so unfortunate because these little scenes where Littlefinger is teaching Sansa how he plays the game are great but 
they're not enough for the transformation she makes in season seven, where she is this formidable player, where she becomes Littlefinger's Frankenweenie. Um, and leads to his death. There's just not enough of it. No. And we see they kind of pass by Brienne and Pod. Very convenient. <laughs> but yeah, Brienne's again trying to push Pod away. He was, he's a loyal lad. We'll give him that. Yeah, he's like the puppy that you you need to throw a rock at him. Yeah. Like Arya did to uh, Nymeria. Loyalty and well hung. Two pretty good attributes. <laughs> That's the perfect man. <laughs> yeah. Give me a call, Pod. And, uh,. She keeps trying to push him back. Pod wants to stay, and Littlefinger and Sansa pass by. Yeah, and that's it. That's the season. That's pretty much... I don't think Brienne does anything else until she kills Stannis. Oh, right. She's going to be looking at the candle. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, maybe season seven is better. <laughs> <laughs> back at Tywin's funeral. Good party. You know, people socializing. Loras Tyrell, not a poet. Yeah, he's grasping. <laughs> I think this is so funny. It happens all the like. A force to be reckoned with. Three different times where Lancel is trying to, like, talk to Cersei and just get a hint, bro. Like, she's not... She don't like you, dude. (laughs) She's just not that into you. He's not into her, either. Yeah, it's not that, like, Cersei just... That's no part of what he wants to say. He doesn't care. It's like, all right. Well, then she sees Lancel Lannister, her former cousin that she used to bang. And love her, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is so funny, the line that she has here when Kevin apologizes for his appearance. And Cersei says, I'm sure he'll grow out of it. (laughs) Whatever it is. <laughs> it's such a passing line, but it's so funny. I could care less about <laughs> religion or fanatics. Yeah. This doesn't interest me at all. They never would have come to the capital when Tywin was alive. Sure, he'll grow out of it. Whatever it is. But then they have a scene together. And Lancel's like, hey, remember when I killed your husband? <laughs> She's like, oh yeah, that did happen. Totally forgot about that. Well, even before that, Kevin tells her that uh, Lancel joined the Sparrows and how they never would have came if Tywin were still alive. No, no, yeah. It just shows the That's presence. part of the black hole. Yeah, the presence that Tywin had and the void he leaves. Yeah, definitely. And he explains about how his, his newfound faith, he's repenting for his sins of sleeping with Cersei and helping to murder King Robert. Cersei's like, dude, I, I don't even speak that language, so. But she's got another great line, too. Lancel says, I led you into the darkness. And she says, I doubt you've led anyone anywhere. <laughs> she's got the quips in this episode. She's the best, man. Yeah, she's, she's got a good season to tell coming you. up. Even when you're still supposed to hate her, you still love her. <laughs> she made me audibly laugh twice with these two lines. Just her face when Lancel was trying to offer his sympathies. She's just like, all right, <laughs> enough. She's so good, man. I will pray for your father's soul. (laughs) The day Tywin Lannister's soul needs your help. Yeah, and going back to Loras with his lover, Oliver, who used to work for Littlefinger. Nice little scene, you know. He said it, when she asks her name, he says, Oliver. Come on, Oliver, man. Well, George does that a lot, like Like Samwell. Yeah. Samuel. Eddard. Edward. Make it easier for me. Um, (laughs) I like that, Oliver. It is fancy. Oliver's a good name, you know? A uh, big Oliver fan. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Um, I might change that. Bo Oliver. <laughs> you should workshop it. Yeah. See, yeah see if it's next, it's next. Next podcast. Tune uh, in. Yeah, but Marjorie. SoundCloud, iTunes. <laughs> Marjorie walks in on, on them, and um, Loris basically tells her, well, Tywin's gone, so he doesn't have to marry Cersei. <laughs> and, and I can bone whoever I want. And he explains to her that she's not going to be going to High Garter anymore. She's going to stay right here in King's Landing with Tommen. And Marjorie seems to have a plan to rid herself of Cersei. Oh, yeah. She doesn't definitely. seem worried. No, yeah. I mean, it benefits Marjorie. Well, talk about Marjorie that she cares for Loras. Saying, yeah, I don't want my brother married to Cersei. I'll deal with her. That's some good big sistering right there. Which means she stays in King's Landing. Which means you're trapped here with Cersei Lannister as your mother by law. Perhaps. 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 Reminds me of Peter Griffin. What is this? Are you going to talk down to everyone just because you won a game of Trivial Pursuit? Perhaps. Yeah, it's surprising, too, how much play they get in Season 5. I wonder, I always forget, too, because the seasons kind of blend together for me now because I've seen them so many times. How much screen time do they get in Season 5? Is this the most action that, that Marjorie gets in particular? Because the way that they end up in this season, they both kind of fail. But it's interesting to see Marjorie get more of, more of the spotlight now. Because she's always been one of my favorite characters, and I think she's one of the smarter characters on the show. So yeah, more Marjorie, the better for me. Yes. Yeah, and this is a scene we talked about, too. I guess we'll just mention it briefly. We kind of blended them together, Tyrion and Varys. Uh, watching this scene, I always imagined that he was drinking some Arizona iced tea. Looks good as hell, man. That wine. That boy is sipping. 
<laughs> Some bomb ass iced tea. But yeah, they discussed Daenerys and they're gonna be on their way. Happy trails. Don't get kidnapped. No, don't get kidnapped. Well, returning to Marine, his door is Zolarak and Dario. You're getting better at that. Yeah, I am. And they come back from Yunkai and they've got some good news. What's the news? Oh, I thought you were going to. I oh, thought you. You wanted me to deliver? And Aaron's on the scene there at Marine. <laughs> oh, Aaron, tell us the news. I'm here live at Yunkai here. <laughs> and the Yunkanese have. Is that how you say it? Yeah, the Yunkanese. Yeah. Okay. Yunkanai. Yunkanai. Have decided to put into power a mixture of former slaves and the old masters. But in return, they want to bring back the fighting pits. Back yeah, to Yeah, we Bo. want those pits back. Oh, oh, I'm. Goose the pits! No, yeah, that's that's the deal that his door says that he negotiated or that is ongoing. But Daenerys says no. No way that I'm opening the pits again. I already let them go back to their former masters with contracts to be teachers and to take on other jobs. But the fighting pits, it's too close to slavery. And that's the stain of slavery. The fact that they put them out there like chickens, like she says, it's cockfighting, um, just to have them entertain the masters, entertain the rich by killing themselves. No way. Yeah, but then back, Later that night, after... What were they doing? No, they're probably just playing Monopoly. Okay. That's how I play it. You yeah. ever play Strip Monopoly? <laughs> but uh, Dario tells her his story and how the fighting pits basically made him who he is today. It allowed him to get name recognition, buy his freedom, and join the Second Sons. Yeah, it's similar to Grey Worm. My path led me to you. Maybe the fighting pits will lead somebody else to a better life. So that's a good reason to open them. Or like an axe in the head. Or an axe in the head, yeah, yeah, either one. Well, you have to, you know, life is taking risks. It seems like a, I, I guess at first, yeah, you don't want to open it because it is so violent. And Daenerys doesn't like violence, but it does seem like a no-brainer. And when she meets Tyrion later in the season, she says, I opened the fighting pits. And Tyrion's like, good, good, I'm glad you did that. You need to let their violence, let them channel their violence in something that's entertaining. Good I, going, Daenerys. I bet it didn't take you, probably did it right away, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right away, you didn't let it, let it drag out. Weeks before you got here, they've yeah. been fighting. <laughs> All right, because that would have been that been real bad if you let it drag out and more people died. And oh, the dragons! We forgot to mention the dragons. And also, Dario also tells her that a dragon queen of no dragons is not a queen. Which yeah, and she's explaining to him, you know, it's still a queen, just not a dragon queen. Dario has that line too, where everybody's so afraid to tell you the truth. I'm gonna lay it for you flat. And like, yeah, that's not the truth. You're just being mean. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. That's just an insult. <laughs> It's like, I'm still, I'm still the queen. Yeah, I, I mean, get the fuck out of here. I'm going to put your head on a spike. Nah, get back here. No, nah, I love you. Finish this game of Monopoly. Yeah, she mentions Drogon's been gone for weeks. He could be in uh, Westeros by now, just starting the war before us. Yeah, maybe he wanted to get a head start. <laughs> the other two dragons are locked up, can't get them out. She can't control them, and she goes to visit them. Not happy. How do they feed him? It's like a drop box? Thinking, Criminals, maybe? That's the death penalty. I was thinking, like, you know, back in the old days, like when, uh, like the blockbuster, they had, like, the drop box. You open <laughs> the latch, put the movie in, and push it back. Just push in a... But it's like a lamb. A person. <laughs> yeah. She was lucky that she didn't get eaten herself. We talked about this in previous episodes. It's so interesting, the history of the dragons in A Song of Ice and Fire lore, how Old Valyria, the people of Old Valyria, would control them. And those secrets have essentially been lost to time. Nobody knows. I think it's kind of like a dog, right? Train them when they're a puppy. She probably didn't do a good job. Bad parenting, I'd say. People theorize that they're just young here, yeah. so they're immature. First time she calls them Viserion and Rhaegal? I think so. Maybe that's why they were mad. <laughs> it's like, it's not our names. You never called us that once. It's just Bird Box, boy, girl. You see Bird Box? No. That's pretty good. Hmm. The episode finishes with John going to talk to Mance Raider, trying to convince him to fight for Stannis, and it's one of the best backs and back and forths that they have as characters. And I said before that I was disappointed that Mance Raider, throughout all the seasons, he has been a little bit underdeveloped. You don't really see his family. We're not sure if he has one. We don't really get into a lot of his motivations, but he is kind of a George Washington-esque character where he took power because... His people needed him, not because he wanted it, not because he craved it. He knew about the threat of the White Walkers, and he knew he needed to get his people south, but he's still not going to bend the knee to Stannis. What do you think about this decision? I get it, that he's trying to stick to his guns, stand for what he believes in, but at the same time, what you believe in will come to fruition if you take this deal. You would get all your people to safety behind the wall. You would have land in Westeros, you'd become part of Westeros, and you'll be safe. Especially, it's probably even a better deal if they took the wall. They probably would have got demolished by another northern army or Stannis' army. And at least here, they're 
joining forces with the greater Westeros, even though it's kind of in shambles, as we'll probably see in season eight, there'll be some attempt to join together to fight beyond fight what's coming. So this kind of just puts them in a better situation. Right. And it's kind of the deal that Mance wanted from John in the season four finale. Kind yeah. Of the, kind of the same exact deal. I think Mance was thinking if we get south of the wall and they give us lands, the wall is going to protect us from the White Walkers anyway. Because the wall has some sort of magic, unless some person flies a dragon over the wall and that dragon gets killed by the Night King and then that dragon is used to destroy the wall, then we're fine. I can understand the logic of I don't want to enlist my people to fight in Stannis Baratheon's army because they have bled enough. But like you said, if you're coming to this country, you have to, your people are going to have to fight. That's just life in Westeros. So you're, I don't know, I think it is probably. But would they expect to get beyond the wall and then settle in the north and not fight anymore? Yeah, come to Dorne. We've got our all-exclusive resorts. It's all-inclusive. No, it's it's still life is still going to be hard. It's going to be less hard. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. I think it is pride with Mance Raider. Deadly sin. It is. It is. It is. Yeah. The greatest fire the North has ever seen. And Tormund even questions his decision in season seven that Mance Raider probably should have knelt, because if he does kneel, then all those people that died at Hardholm are still alive. How many people did they lose at Hardholm? Like ninety-five thousand. Well, even once Mance gets captured, the Wildling. Pretty much they disperse. I mean, there are gatherings then at places like a hard home. And they all got brutalized by the Night King, probably. Yeah, from the other places. Imagine yeah. probably all over the place there's wildling, I guess, settlements. So he indirectly killed like 90% of his people. <laughs> yeah. Good for you, man. <laughs> he did not kneel, though. No. <laughs> I love when John tells him that they're going to burn him alive. He's like, whew. <laughs> Bad Can way I to take go. that deal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. His funeral is as funeral. Funeral. <laughs> his funeral. Well, his execution. Yeah, yeah. his funeral. <laughs> his execution is it's brutal. There's not a reaction except for Celise, who I hate, where she gets off on it. But when Melisandre starts to talk to the free folk, saying that there is only one true king, Stannis, let's see what happens to those who choose the darkness. Yeah, Celise better keep that same energy when it's uh, Shireen up there. <laughs> right, she doesn't. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, no, she really doesn't. Uh, all the reactions, even from Alistair, from Gilly, that she can't even look, and Jon Snow becomes so disgusted. I think it's one of the best Jon Snow moments where he gives Mance Raider mercy by putting that arrow in his heart. Yeah, it's a nice moment, and... Even in the conversations that John has with Stannis, Stannis realizes that there's a mutual respect between the two. That's why he sends John. And even in that whole conversation they have, you can tell there's respect there. And in a different different circumstances, they would be friends and they would be fighting together. And it's just something that we really never got to see and probably would have been cool to see. But John does the right thing here. Yeah, he does. And even the exchange between Mance Raider and Stannis, where he wishes him good fortune in the wars to come. I think Stannis is thinking to himself, under different circumstances, we would be fighting together. Because mm -hmm. even in this moment, he probably respects Mance. Mance says in his conversation with John that Stannis will probably be a better king than all the other fools who have been ruling. I would have liked to have seen the Mance storyline play out from the book. It's a little much, too. It's a lot of, yeah. You still have time. Like, get, just get rid of other stuff. <laughs> yeah. They could have done, done some you tweaking You could have cut it. Sansa out of this season. They cut Bran out. They cut Bran out. You could have cut Sansa out and then come back season six and she's smart. I would have preferred that over what we got. Yeah. And then use the pink, because the pink letter theories are mind-bending. Yeah. That might be George's best uh, theory. When you watched this, did you think there was a chance that that wasn't Mance? That was just at first, but they didn't on. really do any setting. They didn't really do anything to set it up in the book. See what kind of comes after the fact. But maybe you could have made the Sansa storyline here a little bit more palatable with Mance being there, and he kind of maybe he interjects somehow, gets Sansa away. They could have done something with that where he protects her. They could have made some tweaks because they did tweak the Winterfell as a whole. So you could have Mance right in there, and he could be a protector for Sansa or something like that. Yeah, because in the book, Mance is alive. Yeah. They burn the Lord of Bones with the glamour, so everybody thinks it's Mance. And Melisandre sends Mance to Winterfell to save Arya, who's not really Arya. Yeah. <laughs> um, but a lot of people believe that Mance Raider is still alive, that he's in Winterfell, that he's maneuvering, that he's trying to help out Jon Snow, and kind of gets him killed. Not really, but eh, kind of. Kind yeah, of. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. 
more interesting, but it's an end to a character where I feel Kieran Hines is a terrific actor. Mm -hmm. And even watching his facial expressions while he's burning to life is just, it's just horrifying. He's got one of the best faces in Game of Thrones. I said that about the actor who plays Carl Tanner. It's just, it feels like his jaw is always like kind of hanging off. He's like, ah! um, yeah, I, I wish they would have spent more time developing this character because he's, he's very interesting. Do you think in an alternate universe where Mance didn't die and John became King of the North, that Mance would ga gather the wildlings to fight at his side? Yes. We might see that in the book. How awesome would that be? Mance will be like, I'll serve you, but I won't kneel. And John will be like, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Care less. Yeah. It's like, I think you can get Mance to do anything for you as long as he doesn't have to kneel. It's a good episode. Yeah. Yeah, it's all right. I'll probably say it's like an 8.6 for an yeah. opening season. Yeah, there are good moments, but a lot of stuff, I think, looking back on it, sets up stuff I don't like. So it kind of hinders it a little bit. Yeah, it's a solid opening episode. Like you said, it sets up things that you don't like, but you don't see them coming from this. No. Where you think, oh, we're, we're back at it. You know, this is a nice opening reintroduction to the world. I can't wait to see what happens next. Sand Snake's next episode? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I watch this. It's like, you know when you watch a movie and you know a character is going to die, but you just think that he's not going to die this time? Mm -hmm. I'm watching this thinking, ah, the Sand Snakes are not going to show up. <laughs> or they're going to be better. No and no. <laughs> They're coming. They're coming, folks. Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.